Tonight, we appreciate the turnout. I think throughout the evening, there's going to be a few more people coming in. But I'm excited to see this award-winning film from from Matthew. Actually, Matthew is a friend of mine. He has been on my show, and he know he listens. He knows I'm a, a big sports fan, a big trivia fan, and obviously I'm a big Texan. Everything about the state of Texas. And he said, "Would you mind emceeing tonight, having a little fun, and keep it lively?" And it's a few things that I could. I certainly could do. And so a uh, very esteemed panel of question and answers. And so hopefully you've got your thinking caps on because we're going to learn a lot uh, tonight. Now, when Mike introduced me, were you expecting Dan Pastorini, maybe? <laughs> they could have got him. Earl Campbell? Billy Jean King. Jose Cruz. What do all these people have in common? They played sports in that dome. There's been a lot of things happening in that Astrodome. I have an affiliation with the dome, a few things. You know, I'm high tech, and in 1965, that dome was high tech. That was high tech. Um, the Astrodome and I were born in the same year. Just don't figure it out. Just don't figure it out. So that's, I, I've grown up with it. It has been there, and I'm still standing, and the dome is still standing. Will it be standing? We don't know, and that's what we're going to find out tonight. Now. We're going to get started here, and we're going to give a big shout out to everybody live on the web. Why not? The High Tech Texans up here, we're going to be broadcasting this streaming live. And so we thank our broadcasting partner, MicroSearch. They are streaming live, and if you want to go to protect, preservethedome.com, it's preservethedome.com. So actually, I was just checking this out. This is kind of freaky, but I have a license to do this. I'm watching myself, watching me, watching myself live streaming. So it's preservethedome.com. So there's cameras all around. And if you do want to shout out with some questions, there's a hashtag, preserve the dome. And so we'll, we'll get to that. Now, about this film. Short film, which I can appreciate, but it was originally created to be just kind of a home video. It was a tribute about Matthew's grandmother. But it really resonated with a number of people, so much so that it went viral, such as many things do, and the same feeling that Matthew and everybody else wanted to share. So since the creation, the film has won four prestigious film festival awards, including the Golden Remy at the World Fest International Film Festival. Now to start off the night, I want to welcome on stage the director himself of the film. Let's get him up here, Matthew Murphy. You're, you look like Dan What's Pastorini up, with a hat on. Uh, hey, hey well, real quick. <laughs> Selfie. Yeah. That's how we do it. You know what's going on. Now, post it right now. Post right now. Listen, congratulations. You've got a great crowd over here. A yeah. lot of people have seen it. You know, I, I told you, know, I kind of said you started it off because it was just kind of something for a home movie, then a kind of home movie resonated with your grandmother and everything. But why did you create it in the first place? Well, you know, the, one of the main reasons that I created it was to... to really just to be mine. And it was gonna be my emotions, capturing my moments, of uh, picking up the seats at the cell of the Astrodome seats in December. And what I ended up realizing is it was, it was so much more to other people that were a part of that night. And um, I don't wanna give away the film, but uh, it was a tribute to my grandmother. And, uh, and so one of the things that, uh, you know, it, I want to be able to do is, is the seats that I sat in with my grandmother. I want to be able to sit in those seats with my son, Sean, you know, who's sitting over here and uh, right beside us. And, um, and like I said, I started to realize the emotions and, and that were similar to others. And, uh, and, and so I, I decided to interview a few people that were out there. And once we did that, um, it immediately told me that I had an audience because of the people that I, I, was, I was interviewing. And uh, so I knew that I had to make it good. And so I taught myself, this is, I've never done anything like this, but I taught myself how to create a film on iMovie. Because you listen to my radio show, that's why. No, that's why, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and just really, you know, figured out how to do it and put some, put some archival footage there. And it ended up becoming, you know, the last seat at the Dome that we're gonna see tonight. It was such a huge digital file. And so I wasn't able to just email it to these three people that I interviewed. And so what ended up happening is I put it on YouTube and 
Before you know it, it was going viral and went kind of crazy. And the thing that really that was awesome about it is it resonated with so many people and, uh, and they really enjoyed you know, getting back and getting those emotional memories back. And what made you submit it to the festivals? Well, I didn't want really think it was that good, to be honest with you. But uh, so many people kept saying it was, you know, this is good. This is something that's really, it means a lot to me. And, uh, and so, so I, got, I got curious and uh, I looked up a couple of film festival submissions and uh, World Fest International Film Festival was which one of the oldest film festivals here in the United States. I, I submitted it and won the gold Remy. Look at you. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And then so I submitted it some more and so we won four festival films since then. You know, that's how Spielberg got started. <laughs> <laughs> you like Hollywood, Mom? <laughs> you better get out there, get, get ready. Listen, congratulations. Now, enough said. Everybody re ready to see this movie? You ready to see this thing? You scared? You embarrassed? You ready to sign some autographs? Uh, well, there's just one more thing. All right. I've got some special seats for you. Seats for me? Uh-huh. Uh, well, I was going to sit out there and watch it. What's this? Oh, look at this. These are your actual seats. That's the actual that you said seats. It. That's correct. All right, are you, were you four or you were number five? Uh, this is actually kind of interesting. Lovely story here. This is six and four. So apparently five wasn't in really good, but anybody remember when the Astrodome was finished? 1964. Opened mm -hmm. in 65, but the completion of the construction was, was 1964. That's so they just didn't put number five in there. Yeah. Oh, God, Isn't just, that amazing how that happened? I just thought it, somebody from an Aggie actually numbered the system. <laughs> So. Let's sit. You ready to watch this thing? Absolutely. As they say in the business, roll it. <laughs> Today is not an ordinary day in my life. Today, I get to redeem my tickets for the best seat ever. No, it's not for some sporting event or some concert. These tickets are to redeem seats that were in the Astrodome. Hey, how are you? One can? Uh huh. Whoa. Your choice red, yellow, or orange? Orange. Here we go. I'm gonna go inside. Uh, Reliant Arena and pick up the seats. It's kind of interesting. I'm not doing this because I'm some big sports memorabilia collector. I'm just trying to do this because this is my chance to capture my childhood. Something good in my past with my grandmother watching baseball at the eighth wonder of the world, the Astrodome in Houston, Texas. How you doing? What are you doing? Good, how are you? The Astrodome opened in 1965 and was the home of the Houston Oilers and the Houston Astros baseball team until 1999 when the last pitch was thrown during a divisional playoff game with the Atlanta Braves. You got it? Cool. Right, Thank you, sir. The Astrodome was not just a sports arena to me, it was a refuge. It was a place for me to get away from the life that I knew was pretty tough as a child. I was raised by a single mother who did everything possible to make my life normal. But when our air conditioner went out and we couldn't afford to fix it, we came down to Houston to stay with my grandmother and she would take me to the Astrodome to watch her beloved Astros. My grandmother taught me a lot in those seats. She taught me about patience, determination, resilience, 
teamwork, and strategy. It was a time that we were captured for three hours, just her and I, talking about life and cheering on our favorite players like Jose Cruz, Nolan Ryan, and Mike Scott. After leaving the arena and picking up my seats, I just could not leave. I just wanted to stay for a little bit and look at the Astrodome and remember all the good times that we shared there. I looked around and I started to realize I wasn't the only one. So I thought I would take the time and ask the others how they felt and their best memories of the Astrodome. It was a special time for all of us because it's our chance to have one last seat at the dome. Favorite memory was, was the opening season of the Astros coming up here with my cousin and uh, the dads. And uh, I wish I could tell you more about the, the game. Uh, it was yeah. just such a uh, event that I, I just—I was young. I was, I think, 11 years old, uh, and uh, sitting at the game of the opening season at the Dome was was absolutely probably the most memorable time. Uh, probably my best moment was the uh, first uh, division championship when uh, when the Astros won it in the 90s. Uh, my wife and I were able to go out on the field and get some of the dirt. And, I'll celebrate on the field. My favorite moment about the Dome would be being dropped off as a kid, and my dad was on the Houston Rodeo Committee, and I'd get dropped off and I could just walk in without a ticket, just tell them who he was, and they just direct me to where he was at. Uh, one of the other great moments uh, was uh, Lovey Blue Days during uh, Monday night, uh, Dolphins, uh, Oilers. I was a huge Oilers fan, but even a bigger Larry Zonka. Uh, a dolphin fan and uh, ended up crying for uh, for hours after the game. Uh, so there's been many uh, many years of uh, you know between the rodeo and seeing Elvis and uh, being out here for different Oiler games and gambler games and stuff. So getting a piece of these seats is a great experience for me to have as a something that we shared together and he passed on to me and that I'm continuing to do today. Pretty much it's been, I feel like a, a little kid. I've been uh, nervous and uh, excited uh, all day, uh, not knowing what I was going to get, what color, what uh, was going to be available. Uh, and uh, just butterflies all day, even right now. It's just, uh, it's, I'm in awe and uh, disbelief that, uh, that I was able to get these and that I'm sitting here right now. I'm happy that, that I was able to experience it. Uh, that my, my son wasn't old enough to uh, experience the Astrodome or you know, know the history of you know, the Oilers. The, you know, and I love the Texans, but it's, it's different. We don't have that history now of all those you know, years, of, uh, 40, 50 years of history of football here. And, you know, now we're in the, the American League for the Astros, so uh, I guess it's a better, bittersweet uh, kind of day. To have something like this, um, torn down uh, as, as history for, for this city as, as the first dome stadium, eighth wonder of the world, to, um, to go by the wayside is, is very sad. And, uh, I think it'll be a parking lot, and I hate to say that, but it just is what it is, I guess. It's, uh, you know, things are moving too fast for everybody, and uh, I'm just grateful that I get to take a part of it home with me forever be able to share this with my kids someday. I hope that the dome stays. Um, I don't know. Earlier in 2013, crews started demolishing parts of the Astrodome. 
including the ticket offices and the ramps that led up to the upper deck. This was a part of a plan that was to renovate the dome and create it into something new. It was a proposition that Houstonians had an opportunity to vote on so they could save the dome. But sadly, the proposition failed and it left the Astro Dome without a fate. There are no immediate plans to demolish what was known as the eighth wonder of the world, but it's only a matter of time unless a better plan is made that may save this landmark. You know, the beautiful thing about this stadium is, is it transcended over a certain generations or several generations. It wasn't just a kid or, you know, a guy in his 20s. Anybody, any age, they all came together as one, as a fan of the Astros, as a fan of the Oilers, concert goer, as a rodeo goer. This stadium represented so much happiness and, and so much spirit. It's really difficult to understand how something that's brick and mortar can do that. We're very lucky. We have some pretty awesome facilities here in Houston. You got the Reliance Center and the Minute Maid Park, Toyota Center. Nothing will compare to the Astro Dome. The Dome is an engineering model that can never be repeated. It was first in many ways, including being the first indoor stadium, the first ever to have an animated scoreboard, and the first to have indoor grass known as AstroTurf that changed the way we watch sports today. I hope we can keep it. I hope we can live to be able to tell stories and not just show pictures, to actually take our children and touch the stadium. I hope what they're tearing down just only helps improve it in the future. But the structure itself stays. And the only way we can do that is we as fans who are passionate about this dome can spend time and create an idea and a plan that works and that everyone accepts. History does not always have to crumble. It can't be preserved. And I hope we can do that. I just had one last thing that I had to do before I left. It was time for me to take my last seat at the dome. Anybody have a tissue? Oh my goodness! 
I got for Klimp there. Talk amongst yourself. Should the dome stand or not? We'll debate that a little bit. Matthew, congratulations. Just a wonderful, wonderful. And you've never directed or put together anything before? No. Gotcha. No, no. Have, a, have a seat. Uh, you guys enjoy it? Right? If I ask everybody in here, raise your hand. You have a memory of the dome, don't you? Every single person has some sort of memory of the dome. Whether you lived in Houston, whether you're not from Houston, I mean, we, the world's first dome team. And I, I like that. I'm. As a media guy, I'm always trying to prop up. This is the best. This is the biggest. This was the first, and this was the biggest. You look, Guinness Book of World's Record. It was the world's first dome stadium, and uh, the memories, without a doubt. I mean, I not, did not grow up here, but the fact is, and, and all across Texas, this in the country and the world, uh, there's a lot of memories. Just mostly thanks to those great sports stories. So that was a wonderful job. There's a lot of credits too. Oh, look, Sean Murphy. Hey, he's dedicated. Hey, Sean, that's his son. Your name's in the credits. That's great. <laughs> What we're going to do, we're going to introduce a panel. And you put together a great panel, and uh, it's going to be exciting and fun, very interactive. And uh, they're going to join us on stage to field some questions about the past, the present, and the future of the Astrodome. And, rem and remember that. That's the theme, the past, the present, and future. And we'll explain here. We want to give you a little instruction on how the Q&A is going to work. Again, the past, present, and the future. So... We're going to give you, we'll have a microphone, we'll run out, raise your hand, we're going to give you no more than a minute, questions about the past, the present, and the future that members of the panel can answer with factual information. So we want you to be respectful of our panel because they generously devoted their time to be here this evening. Now, to help maintain this format, our assistants, I see them all around out there, uh, we're going to ask you to raise your hand, they're going to come to you and they're going to ask what type of question you want, whether past, present, or future, before speaking to the panel, we have a card that will hold up. Now, the cards are going to be different colors. The past, we're going to give you a red. The present, we're going to give you a yellow. The future, we're going to give you a blue. And if you have a question about the film, it's going to be orange. And I see the theme where you went over here, the rainbow jerseys of the Houston <laughs> Astros. It's very smart. We keep the theme here. Uh, the questions are going to be delivered evenly among the panel based on the order of the past, the present, and the future of the dome, Question specifically for Matthew um, about our film, you can ask him. And also, our online audience, shout out to you. If you're streaming at preservethedome.com, we want you to participate. Hashtag preserve the dome. It's a social chat on Twitter and even Facebook. We're going to be monitoring those. And if we see, some, see a question, we'll see if we can throw it in. So people all around the world are watching us right now. <laughs> so is everybody ready for the panel? Let's do this thing. All right. Please start by raising your hands so our assistants can start handing out the cards, but we'll get the panel up here. Fielding questions regarding the Astrodome's past, the ghost of Astrodome past, please welcome David Bush from Preservation. Uh, preservation, where is Deservation? Preservation Houston. Hello, David. Come on up here, sir. Mr. Preservation Houston yourself. How are you? Now, since the Astrodome, as we said, is famous around the world, joining us to field questions about the present day situation from the time the doors were closed for public use to today, please welcome Beth Whitehour of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I don't think Beth's here right now, but she'll be coming in pretty soon. She had another engagement she had to finish up, so she's on her way. I will have to field those questions yeah. about the preservation. <laughs> <laughs> Preservations. No. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text her. Now, <laughs> completing the panel discussed the future. And that's a very important. Now, obviously, that's, that was the, 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 the whole crux of your film. What's going to happen? The future of that Astrodome. Please welcome a man that he really doesn't need much of an introduction here in Houston. You know him as Mr. Hunker Down Man himself. He is the judge of Harris County, Ed Emmett. Watch out, he's got a coffee in his hand, so he is, he is geared up. Hello, Judge, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And yeah, we'll leave that one for bad. We'll leave it for bad. So, is he, technically, she is the, the ghost of the present, because yeah. <laughs> so she, she's not here. Yeah. You see what I did there? Yeah. All right, so uh, you guys are ready. So we have uh, a few microphones down there. David, there's one near you if you want to uh, go ahead and, uh, and pick the microphone up, and we'll just start going uh, round and round. Now, um, I'm going to start with you, David, because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make this a really big uh, sports theme here. So we're going to have you uh, bat leadoff, if that's okay. All right. Give us a brief background about how the Dome became into existence. Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, Houston really wanted a big league sports team, 
and at the time, baseball was pretty much limited to the East Coast and had just made a move to the West Coast after World War II. Um, and it was played outdoors. And Major League Baseball was not inclined to move to a place that was really hot and really humid. Uh, and they didn't think people would sit outside. And uh, Houston came up with this proposal for this stadium that uh, would take care of that and would be really one of a kind as far as, as, as Major League Baseball was concerned. And it, what's interesting when you read it, football wasn't that big a consideration back then. Um, professional football was not considered in the, in, in the same league as baseball. And if you were gonna be a major league city, you needed a baseball team. And the city was growing by leaps and bounds after World War II. And this was one way to put Houston on the map, to acknowledge that it, it had grown to become, it, it was by then the largest city in the South and was becoming a major city that a lot of people weren't recognizing, and that was a way to, to really put Houston on the map. 1965, huh? No one really wanted to sit out in 104 degrees weather with mosquitoes. Was that the whole thing? <laughs> Judge Hoffines <laughs> Judge Hoffines really did, did have, have, have a vision. Um, uh, Judge Jim, I'm going to ask you. Uh, we're going to kind of use you as cleanup since Beth is not here yet. We know the doors have been closed for a while. We saw what it looks like right now. It's uh, cordoned off, a lot of rubble, and it's, the, the fin and it's fenced off. Uh, tell the audience some of the key facts that may be misrepresentative or maybe confusing to the public about the Astrodome right now. Uh, th there are a lot of things that either aren't understood or are confusing. First, you know, it's always talked about in terms of Houston. But the official name is the Harris County Dome Stadium. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a Harris County facility. It's not a city of Houston facility. The city really has absolutely nothing to do with it other than it's located inside the city limits. The other thing is, uh, when I became county judge in 2007, the decision had already been made uh, by Commissioner's Court, my predecessor, to give exclusive rights to develop the dome into a hotel. And, you know, I came in, far be it from me to go back and undo a decision that had been made. But in fact, once we started looking at it, we realized that the people who were going to build the hotel didn't have the money to build a hotel. It was never going to work. And so it took a couple of years to unplug that. So there's a lot of discussion about, well, why has it just been sitting there for that long? Well, that's one of the reasons. But the other thing that really people don't understand is the dome is completely paid for. There aren't any outstanding bonds anymore. It really doesn't cost that much to keep up. And it is structurally sound, which is one reason uh, we decided to engage in the, in the power washing, because too many people think, oh, it's just this deteriorating building that's about to fall down. And it, it's far from that. It is a structurally sound building. It is the only existing building that I know of in the world with 360,000 square feet of column-free space, and it belongs to the taxpayers, and we need to find a way to use it. All right, now I'm sure we'll get uh, more questions on that. I think we have our third ghost of Astrodome present, Beth Whitehour. Let's welcome her. She's with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. How are you? It's good to see you. Please, please have a seat. This is a classic case of trying to fit too much into one day. <laughs> I'm ultimately embarrassed because this man can fit 10 times more than I can into one day. So. Well, we're going to, we're going to, Beth, uh, we're going to throw you right into the fire, okay, if we can ask you a question. So uh, we're just, I'm, I'm throwing one out and we're going to have the audience ask. And, you know, we already have a past, a present, and a future, and, and we're going to do a little present. The, um, what has happened to the dome since the doors closed? Uh, they, they shut down for public use. What has been going on from the day the doors closed to what is going on right now, Beth? Wow, that is the fire. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I don't know. These, are, okay. are on the wire. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I'm the, the best person to answer that, but I'll take a shot at it and someone can correct me uh, if I miss any information. So since the dome closed, I think the last event was 
early 2008, um, and the certificate of occupancy was pulled by the city of Houston. Uh, since then, it's been primarily used as a warehousing facility. So it stores uh, equipment and um, uh, other needs for NRG Park. It also serves, a lot of folks don't know that all the utilities to serve the park actually run through the Astrodome, so it plays a significant role uh, as a conduit for those utilities that serve the NRG Center and the arena and the stadium uh, and other areas of the park. And um, it's, it's been lying there, sadly, urging us and asking us to pay attention to it. So it really has not been uh, used by the public. It is a Harris County asset that we own, that we have invested in, and that deserves to be uh, reinvested in so it can be a public asset again. Oh, that's good. Now, so we've kind of covered how it started, what the concept was, thanks to David. What's happened between the door shutting and right now, and obviously Judge Jimmit is, you know, he kind of explained, you know, where we are, the, uh, the county owns it. And uh, so we, it's, there's your past, present, and future. Now, we have some cards, and we want everybody to start raising their hands right now because we're going to come out, and we're going to give you the microphone because I'm sure there's a number of questions. Everybody online right now, if you can hear us, Curtis, watching online courtesy of Microsearch, hit that hashtag, preserve the dome. Preserve the dome. You can tweet it. Facebook, I hear you checking it right now. it right now. This is, this is you know, <laughs> how we do leave things live. Uh, Matthew's going to look at it. And if you hear your question, uh, you'll be famous when we, uh, when we read it. So preserve the dome. So questions right now. First questions, anyone? Just raise your hand. And then we also have, a, I think, of a, uh, of a microphone. There you go. Right back here. Do we have a microphone? And if you could tell us your name, sir. Hi, my name is Ray Walker. Ray, question? Yeah, Judge Emmett, thank you so much for being such a proponent of saving the dome. Uh, I, as a third-generation Houstonian, I'm very proud of Houston, and this is one of the icons of Houston that I remember since I was a child, and I'd hate to see it go away. Uh, that said, I remember we did, meaning Houston, the city, did a uh, survey at one time where they were taking a bunch of ideas uh, that were brought forth about what we should do with the dome. And then that went away, and then we, you came up with a brilliant idea, or somebody came up with a brilliant idea, and you... You, you led the banner and said, let's do a park out of that. I love that idea. But are we dead with that? Are we moving forward with that? Where, where was that idea? And if so, are we going to open the door up for more ideas? I got an idea. I'm sure thousands of other people have ideas that we would like to share with others so that we could throw it out there and, and think about it. Uh, first, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. We've got to get people to say Harris County, not Harris Houston. County. <laughs> because that is part of the confusion. No, that idea is moving forward. Uh, it's one of those situations, I'd, I have to admit, the bond failure may have been one of the best things that happened uh, because uh, I, and I'll take a large part of the blame, didn't explain it very well. People said, well, we don't need another convention center. And we were trying to turn it into a multi-purpose facility. That's hard to explain. But then the idea of an indoor park has really seemed to capture the people's imagination because you can do so many things with a park. You can put a concert pavilion in. You can put various museums in. You can put hike and bike trails. You can do all kinds of things. And at the, at the end, basically you have almost nine acres of field where the playing field used to be. So all those festivals and gatherings that uh, we have in our community, they can be held in an indoor climate. So uh, the next step in that is that the Urban Land Institute is coming to town in mid-December, and they have, they're going to form what's called a panel. The Sports and Convention Corp is funding that. Uh, thank you, Edgardo. And that panel is a panel of experts, and they're going to be seeking input from the community. Uh, and then they will come up at the end of a week and tell us, this is the way we think you ought to go about it, and we're, we're moving forward. Uh, we've been in a period right now where you had a little election going on. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up, Christmas is coming up, but right after the first of the year, I think you'll see a lot of activity. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Next one right over here is a gentleman wearing an Astros throwback uni. And uh, before we do that, I've got a question coming in. Ooh. It's uh, The question is, 
what are some of the significant, this is a past question, what are some of the significant events that happened in the Astrodome? Well, most people think in terms of sports, obviously, but it, already, it always was a multi-purpose facility. Um, it's not gonna be a matter of reinventing it as a multi-purpose facility because it always was. But of course, there was Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs, which was one of the bigger um, focus of the 70s, I guess, the battle of the sexes. Um, of course, when the Astros were, were playing for, uh, that at the end, when they were playing Atlanta to go to the World Series. Um, it's, it's odd, everybody got different memories, whether they're associated with the rodeo and the different performances at the rodeo, whether it was Elvis, people mention Elvis a lot. Um, I saw Sonny and Cher at the rodeo, um, <laughs> which was kind of weird because they had just announced for divorce and they weren't speaking to each other, so they were just out on the stage in the middle of the stadium not talking to each other. Um, but... Uh, it's um, and a lot of whether what the events are are really personal, and I, I I almost hate to say you know it's just Elvis, it's just Billie Jean King, it's it's just associated with the Astros, uh, it's just associated with the Oilers, because you know there were political conventions there um, in in the '90s, and so it it sort of runs the scope. There were also all the the offshore technology conferences there. So, so there's sort of a, a broad use that you kind of hate to pick one or two events for its significance. Now, I'll come back a little, Skip. So uh, Judge Jimin and also Beth, I'm gonna ask you your favorite memories too, but I do wanna get to the audience. Uh, gentlemen in the throwback Strohs jersey. What is your name, sir? My name is Ricky Cardenas. Question? I just wanna say thanks, Matthew, for the film. It was pretty good. It was great, actually. Um, so I got a two-part question. Um, I went to a, uh, a collector show, a memorabilia show, uh, a few years back, well, a couple years back. And uh, there was a bunch of Astros chairs that one of the vendors had in there. And one of the particular sets of chairs he had was wooden uh, slats. They were navy blue, and it was a wooden slat chair. And I'd never seen those. I've only ever been familiar with you know, the foam chairs, the orange, yellow, and what have you. So I was wondering where in the dome, the Harris County dome, <laughs> were, the, were these seats located? I'd never seen them before, so I was wondering where actually in the dome were they located? And then the second part of this question is, is there, are there any plans to release the sale of, of any more seats in the dome? That's kind of a two-part question. You, you know the past, you know, you, you know anything about those seats? I thought they were always padded. One of the, what I was reading about the dome Part of, the, part of the, the reason the stadium had padded seats was to get people into it away from their television sets. That was part of the reason for designing the stadium that way, that baseball was losing a lot of fans who were staying home and just watching the games on TV, and that this was a way to get people into basically the comfort of their own living room. Yep. My guess is they were probably from the previous, there was a temporary stadium, I believe, built for the Colt 45s as the Astrodome was under construction. So that would be my guess. And I actually Oh, this guy that. knows. Yeah. Mr. Maintenance guy inside the Astrodome. Mr. Maintenance of the Astrodome. Oh, look at you. Let's get you a microphone, Sean. Very clean bill of health. Everything's good. <laughs> So the, so the question, Sean, I, I guess is, at first part, like that, that, so is there any more things going on sale? What's inside right now? Well, I'm gonna have to ask him before I give that information out, but <laughs> the thing about the seats is those wooden back seats were from the bleacher seats in center field on level four. So all of center field was, um, they were for both the Oilers, they were cheap seats, and for the Astros as well. So that's what those seats were from. I, I believe that at some point in the spring, there may be more seats for sale, but I can neither confirm nor deny unless, <laughs> unless Mr. Cologne says I can. Uh, we're always considering uh, doing that. The uh, sale that we had last year was uh, extremely successful. Uh, we, by the way, 
uh, the proceeds of that sale is what is uh, paying for the uh, power wash of the Astrodome that the uh, judge was talking about a second ago. But um, we, we do have uh, plenty of seats. So if any of you want to buy one, let me know, and uh, we'll make sure that, uh, that you get access to it. But um, yes, we may be uh, thinking about you know, selling some of the uh, seats that we have. Good. We got some great inside information. You know, I was thinking about this too. A lot of the memories that we're coming up with are, are, are sports related. I mean, David, you, you talked about some, some political things. And, you know, I think probably one of the, the last and lasting memories of the Astrodome was the national attention it got uh, for Hurricane Katrina. And obviously, Judge Emmett, you were very, very involved in that. But uh, that, No, uh, I wasn't involved in that. That was my predecessor. <laughs> oh, that's right. But, it, but the, the, the Hurricane Katrina, I mean, that was, I mean, I mean there was internat international press down here where Houston opened. I mean, that was what a great city Houston is of opening up its, its old home to shelter people. Yeah, uh, I have to comment on the seat sales. Uh, Edgardo may fuss at me for telling this story. Uh, they actually went out and tried to get auction houses to run the auction. And the major auction houses all said, there's not going to be any interest, so we're not going to do it. So then when the folks at Inter then Reliant did it themselves, they were overwhelmed. They're really not in the auction business. I think they did a really good job for the circumstances. But it showed just how great the interest is in, in the dome. Um, my guess is the next time we have a sale, probably some auction house will be interested in participating. But uh, even a sale of seats uh, has to go before the Texas Historical Commission to get approval, uh, which frankly is fine with me right now. That's probably a good position for us to be in. We have a question over here. There yes, we, go. we do. We What's have a name? future question here. Can I hold some <clears throat> Uh, I don't have to stand up, do I? You don't have to. Thank God. <laughs> uh, a preface and then question, mostly aimed at you, Judge. Uh, the preface is obviously everyone here has some level of emotional equity in this conversation. And probably our parents had some financial equity in this situation. So I just wanted to recognize that. Tooth, I am definition ambivalence when it comes to the dome. Uh, what you did, Matt, is awesome. Uh, and no one in this room does not have emotional connection to this real estate development who was developed by, de facto developed by the county judge, uh, Hoffarnt. Two things you said. Number one, the bonds are paid off. I did not expect to hear that. Number two, structurally sound. I did not expect to hear that either. If, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. Well, maybe I am, but... Go ahead. Uh, mm, last time I paid attention, the bonds were not paid off. And structurally sound, I never paid attention enough to know. So if both those are true, then that's just a raw hunk of something to be done with, torn down, which would cost money, or power wash, which is already paid for, or something else, dot, 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 dot. Somewhere in there, there's a question or a request for a response. Okay, uh, first, I'm gonna go off topic a little. You mentioned Judge Hoffines. A lot of people don't understand he was not the county judge when the dome was built. He had been county judge 30 years earlier. And between, the, see, you didn't know that. He was county judge when he was in his 20s and somewhere in the 1930s. Subsequent to that, he actually served two terms as mayor of Houston, but he never went by mayor, he always went by judge. And it started as a private development. And when the private development of the Astrodome didn't work out, that's when the county stepped in and it became the Harris County Dome Stadium. So we're at a point now where uh, the dome is paid off. Uh, it does not cost that much to, to maintain. And I think that has really changed a lot of people's thinking. But let me say one thing very clearly. The people who want to tear it down, they're so emotional about it. We have talk show hosts who just go off on rants. And I'm going, 
Why? I mean, why are you so adamant about tearing something up or tearing something down? You tear it up, tear it down. Anyway, and, and so I think it's, it's really time for people to start pushing back. And the indoor park may not be everybody's idea, but it is the idea that has captured the imagination most right now. And I think it is the one thing that, uh, I'll use the term advertise, that's not right, but could be advertised worldwide and people would go, you know what, they're really doing something right over there again. They're taking an outdoor activity and moving it indoors, which is what the whole thing was about in the first place. And in this case, the things you can do in a park space like that uh, are just almost limitless, which makes it hard then to answer the question, how much is it gonna cost? Depends on what you put in the park. And so, uh, but we are moving forward. I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, one of the things that I actually heard and in, in you actually said in your announcement is uh, when someone asks you, how much is it gonna cost to fix it up? The thing that really stood out to me was less than it would cost to tear it down, which can, can you just kind of tell us what the estimates are on, on that particular? Well, to just clean it up and, and make it fit for human habitation, uh, we don't have a figure yet. But to demolish it, you have to understand the plan to demolish it was going to cost $68 million. Just to fill the hole will cost $15 million. So when uh, a recent poll was taken and they said public doesn't want to spend any more tax dollars on the dome, guess what? You're going to spend tax dollars on the dome either way. So would you rather spend tax dollars and have something when you're through or spend tax dollars and have nothing? Uh, I think most people will go for the something. Got a question here, pretty lady in the red boots, front row. Oh, you're not next? I think, I don't know. She is? All right. The black boots Hello. in the front row. There you go, Hello. yes ma'am, what's your name? Mona Arnold. Mona, what's your question? Um, I have a future question, but first I just wanted to talk about the, the past with me and my husband and the dome, the Harris County dome. Um, I grew up in Harris County and saw the dome being built along with my husband. He went to Westbury and he was a lot closer to it than I was. But um, I saw a bullfight there with my dad um, when I was probably a preteen or whatever. Uh, they didn't kill the bull because of the Humane Society, which was a good thing. But um, we also, my husband and I stood in line for 12 and a half hours when we got our seats. And because we stood in line so long, we went ahead and got the maximum amount of seats because we, we were there for so long. Um, another thing is um, I used to go to the Colt Stadium there where the Astrodome was and Playland Park, which nobody has brought up. Um, rode the, roller, the wooden roller coaster and all that. And I was kind of upset when they tore down Playland Park and the Colt Stadium and built the dome. But now I would be terribly upset if they tore down the dome. I would be horrified. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the future of the dome is. The park sounds great. My question probably actually goes to the top of the state of Texas, which I wish they would pass gambling and put in a casino. That would pay off all of our taxes. That would pay off, we, our taxes wouldn't go up because we would have a casino and Louisiana and Nevada would not get the money. That's just my, I'm not a gambler, but I just think it'd be a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Casinos, I, that's big. I think that's outside of this jurisdiction. I think it's a st state issue, but <laughs> I'm, I am wondering what the possibilities of, of, I don't know, going to the state, because if they do one day legalize gambling in the state of Texas, and I hopefully it is soon, I'm a, I'm a proponent of that. That is number one. That's probably the, the ultimate place to put it. Well, in, in talking about the conversion to a hotel, I, I talk to people who are in the hotel business and ask them, does this work as a hotel? And they said, absolutely not, with one exception, if you put a casino in with the hotel. Uh, but as Beth just leaned over and reminded me, that's above my pay grade. That's <laughs> something the legislature is going to have to do. I don't see it happening anytime soon. Although I did come up and I thought, you know, Indian tribes maybe we could lease it to an Indian tribe. <laughs> uh, hadn't been able to figure out how to make that one work yet. Dave, did you have something? Well, actually, when 
Harris County started to build the dome, they had to get the state legislature to pass a law because it was being built basically for private enterprise to lease from the county. And it was illegal in Texas at the time. So they had to start at the legislature back then. So it's, it, it's part of its history. Question? <laughs> About the hotel? So, so uh, there's another one that comes on Twitter. in. Yeah, on okay, Twitter. hashtag preserve the dome. Thank you very much. The audience watching right now, preserve the dome.com. Yeah, so the, uh, the question is for Beth. Beth, uh, they want to know about the landmarking issue and, and, and how, how the landmarking occurred uh, and, and what was the process for that. Uh, well, landmark is a loaded term, and we in the field of preservation have a lot of lingo that this uh, provides us a really good opportunity uh, to try and clarify some of that. Uh, the dome was uh, listed in the National Register of Historic Places in March of this year. That's a federal designation that occurs through the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior. Um, it is primarily honorific, however, depending on our reuse, it might afford the um, redevelopment effort tax incentives at the state and local efforts. So that is a designation at the federal level uh, that might have incentives to come with it. Uh, there was a lot of conversation uh, mid-year about the Texas State Antiquities Landmark designation, uh, which is a similar designation on the state level. However, it does uh, come with a little more strings than the federal designation does in that, as the judge has mentioned, before any work is performed to the interior or exterior of the Astrodome, it would need to be reviewed and permitted by the State Historic Preservation Agency, the Texas Historical Commission. Um, that designation has not been awarded yet. It is not a state antiquities landmark. However, as the Texas law reads today, once an application has been submitted for that designation, the rules apply. So currently, as the judge mentioned, uh, if we were to issue a, a sale or an auction of the seats inside, that would trigger a permit. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, not a permit, a review by the Texas Historical Commission. And I think similarly, um, the, the exterior cleaning that will occur in the next couple of, of months did require review from the Texas Historical Commission. They looked at the methods that would be applied and they concurred that yes, this was a safe uh, exercise and they agreed that it was appropriate to pr be performed on the exterior of the Astrodome. So um, they aren't protections. By no means are they uh, prohibiting the demolition of the building or the alteration of the building, but they do uh, uh, inflict, perhaps, a, a level of review which we feel in the field of preservation is warranted. This is an iconic, significant building nationally, internationally, and it deserves that additional level of review before we move to alter or demolish the building. Good inside information. We have a question right here, sir, front row. Yes. Hi, my name is Michael Pulaski. I wanted to say thank you, Matthew. It was a really great film and struck thank an you. emotional. It's interesting to have an emotional connection to, to the Astrodome. Um, I'm curious, what is, if there is a timeline in making a decision on what will happen? Well, first, let me back up and say, who gets to make the decision? And the decision is made by the Harris County Commissioner's Court, uh, myself and the four county commissioners. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, at this point, uh, I always hesitate to speak for the commissioners, but I know of nobody who says we need to tear down the dome. So I think everybody is, is on board with the idea of finding a, a reuse for the dome. The park idea, as I said, has, has uh, gained some traction we want to move as quickly as we can, but as I said, right after the first of the year, we'll crank up. If it involves enough public dollars to require a bond election, then we have to decide when to have the bond election. And being real candid, there's a bit of a political calculation there. Do you have it in May? Do you have it in November? 
Do you have it when it's a presidential year? Do you have it, you know, those, those kind of things. Because turnouts in bond elections uh, are interesting. Yes, the bond election for the Dome failed. The same day there was, an, and I, I was actually asked to ask all of you to raise your hands if you voted in the election, but I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> Just most of you probably <laughs> did, but some of you probably didn't. Uh, on the same ballot was another proposition to build a joint processing center. Harris County and the city, it would save taxpayers $25 million a year, allow the city to close their jail. Nobody was against it. Not a single word was spoken or written against it. Everybody was for it, and it only passed by 475 votes. And you go, why? I mean, you know, it made no sense. So we were in a time when, and, and frankly, we will be next time. We're going to need your help when the decision is really put out there. Uh, because you just have some people who are going to vote against all bonds, and you have some people who just want to tear down the dome, and we've got to outnumber those two groups. All right, we have one okay. more question over on this side. There we go. Yeah, actually, I'm a trader. Even though I have this red card, I have a present and future question. Bob Ford. My question has to do with something different than anybody I've heard speak so far. Most of the folks here talked about their emotional attachment. Well, I came too late to be emotionally attached. What's the hook for those of us who have no emotional connection? Judge. Well, Beth is present. She came late, too. Not only tonight, but in general to the community. Yes, correct. You stole my line. That was going to be mine. Um, yes, so I too, um, who this is my day-to-day -day job now, and I have very little emotional connection to the Dome. Um, so I think it's a, a very appropriate and interesting question, and uh, one that kind of we collectively in the preservation field and in the, the pro-Astrodome reuse uh, uh, column have have talked about in the last year and a half. How do we appeal to those folks who don't have an emotional connection with the dome? Um, and I don't know that we have the answer, but I can tell you what we've done thus far. We've looked at the architectural significance, engineering significance of the building. Um, it was the first of its kind in the world. Um, we know in the field of preservation, after many years of doing this, that buildings need to get to that 50 to 55 year age limit before folks will start recognizing their significance in historic, from a historical perspective. Um, it has something to do with what you grew up with and what was built during your, uh, your, your um, youth or your young adulthood and having the perspective to recognize uh, what occurred there. We've also looked at the social um, impact of the Astrodome from an integration standpoint in Houston and among the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Uh, we've looked at it as a representation and tried to talk about it to those who aren't, um, who aren't uh, feeling the tug at the heartstrings uh, from experiencing the Astrodome. We've talked about it as a representation of Houston and the innovation, not just in Houston and Harris County, but <laughs> I'm going to get an elbow here, too, don't worry. Uh, but the country, I mean, the mid-60s, post-Kennedy, the race to space, this, rep this one building, this iconic uh, design represents a, a nationwide movement and feeling and pride in where the United States was and in our technology and our, our progress forward. So uh, we don't have the answer yet, but I can tell you that we're looking at a multitude of different messages as we talk about the Astrodome and why it's significant and why it deserves to be preserved and reused for the next 40 plus years. I think the hook is going to be, it's your building and you get to use it. Uh, the idea for a long time was how do we turn it into something private? Nobody came forward with money. So if they're not gonna come forward with money, it cost us to step back and say, well, wait a minute. I think people can really get into the idea. I mean, for example, uh, my youngest daughter, who by the way is a member of this congregation, so I'm used to this building quite a bit. Uh, she has three kids under three. That's a separate subject that I need to talk to her about. <laughs> but she and all her friends, 
just became ecstatic at the idea of having a, an indoor park to go to. And think about taking your family there for picnics and think about if you wanna have a, a family reunion and your picnics out on the grounds. I guarantee you the dome, once it's cleaned up just a little bit, just enough for people to go inside, anybody who walks into the center of that field and looks up, it'll be like that scene from Field of Dreams where the guy finally saw it and he goes, do not sell this farm. I think that's what people will say about the dome. Do not tear this down. We got one question actually on uh, uh, hashtag preserve the dome. Yes, so actually I, w I would own it to comment a little bit too. Um, I wanna ask you in the audience and actually out on, on the wonderful web, uh, sponsored by MicroSearch, thank you very much. Um, when you can think of three landmarks in Texas, give me three. Anybody? Alamo, Alamo okay. State Capitol. State Capitol, okay. San Jacinto Monument, because you're from Houston, Riley. Do you think that somebody from Austin or Dallas or somebody like that would say the San Jacinto Monument? Mm. Do you think they'd probably say the Astrodome? It's that iconic. And when you really, really, boil, when it boils down to it, it's iconic not only in the state, the United States, it's iconic all over the world. When I was in the Navy and I did a lot of traveling around, I actually would tell people I'm from Texas and they would say, oh, the Dallas Cowboys in the Astrodome. And then I spent the next 20 minutes trying to explain that the Cowboys did not play in the Astrodome. <laughs> but either way, it is that iconic and it was something that the eyes of the world were looking at. And I've heard Beth say this and several other people, the eyes of the world are looking on us now again. And so we have a chance to actually be innovative and be a forward thinker again and turn it into something that everybody will enjoy. So anyhow, the question that we uh, got from, uh, uh, from Twitter is, is uh, I've heard that it played an integral role in integration. So this is a past question. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, it did. The Astrodome was actually integrated from day one. Um, Houston was segregated as Texas was and the South was. Um, separate restrooms, separate seating facilities and separate seating sections in theaters. Um, Houston was integrated very quietly in a way that probably couldn't have happened today in that the community leaders worked with the different business leaders to, to get integration done very quietly, and convince the media not to cover it, which was, you really would, would, would not get today. Um, <coughs> Judge Hoffines went to the African American community and promised them that the stadium would be integrated from day one. There would not be separate restroom facilities. There would not be separate seating sections. Um, they brought in Willie Mays and other African-American baseball players and sent sound trucks out into the African-American community to get their support for the bond issue. And it was a bond issue and it was not definitely going to pass. But um, that was one way to get community support and it, it played a huge role in the Astrodome being built, actually. No, that's a great perspective. And actually, D Dave, you talk about knowing the history of the Astrodome. I thought I was being pretty smart and cute beforehand to try to stump them. And I said, I bet you don't know this. And this is actually, don't say it, Dave, but good trivia question. Anybody know who hit the very first home run in the Astrodome? Mickey Mantle. I used, to, I used to be, you know, it was a great bar bet, and apparently nobody's going to buy me a beer because the secret's out right now, but he knows it all. Got a question right over here, yes, in the red. Yes, and it has to do with the uh, question that was just posed because I wanted to uh, ask uh, one of our uh, visitors here, uh, Reverend Lawson, who was actually there. Uh, he can probably better answer that uh, question about the uh, significance of the building. Well, first of all, I do want to thank Mr. Murphy for this film, and I hope that it gets shown wi widely. 
Uh, then second of all, I do want to thank Judge Emmett uh, for staying so steadfast on, on trying to preserve the astronaut. <laughs> what has been said is, is in fact true. That's basically what happened. Uh, but Houston, uh, unlike most other cities in the South, was struggling to become a world economy. Uh, we had a port. Uh, we uh, had oil and gas companies wanting to have headquarters here. And uh, probably one of the biggest things was Judge Hoffheins uh, interested in, in, in getting Major League Baseball here. Uh, but uh, the question was, this is 1963, 64, 65, and the country remembered Birmingham, and we wondered how is it possible to desegregate Houston uh, without having another Birmingham? And the answer was, court the economy. You're trying to uh, build a stadium for, for Major League Baseball. Uh, somebody like Willie Mays is not going to come to Houston uh, to play baseball in this stadium. Uh, but uh, major leaders from both the white and the African-American community meeting together, and this is the reason why uh, the media agreed not to cover the quiet desegregation, because we simply wanted uh, the entire state uh, to know that Houston was now desegregated, and it had just happened, and it was past news. Um, so the Dome Stadium actually played a major part in the desegregation of Houston. Houston would probably not have been desegregated had there not been the argument, if we don't want to have a Birmingham and we do want to have somebody like, like Willie Mays uh, in Houston, we had better desegregate and not be in the same situation as Birmingham. So the building of, a, of, 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 of the Dome Stadium played a major part in the argument that said to Houston's leaders, uh, we need to get this taken care of now. Uh, and, and, and it certainly is true that when Mays came to town, he was probably the biggest name in, in baseball at that time, white or black, uh, but when he came to this town, uh, he was the biggest sales force for the building of the Astrodome. Say hey, thank you, Reverend Lawson. Yeah. Good insight, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, the gentleman right here with a blue card, right here, thank you. And your name, sir? I've got to get up first. <laughs> Hi, the name is Fred Arnold, and great work, young man, on, on this, this uh, film. The, the day that, you, you, that you're pictured in, in the seats uh, is also a day that, that I was out there getting our seats. And I happened to have been in the same parking lot, and I turned around with my iPhone and took a picture of the dome. Uh, my wife and, uh, always wanted for us to have a picture with the dome because hopefully it, it was never torn down, but we wanted to have a memory. And so we Photoshopped our, uh, we have a 1957 Chevrolet. We Photoshopped our Chevrolet and us in the parking lot, and for all in, in, intents and purposes, you can't tell that that wasn't wasn't uh, taken. For every car show that we go to, and, and we used it as our Christmas card, by the way, every car show that we go to, we put that picture in the trunk, and and I have a, a, a bumper sticker, "Save the Dome," and generates a lot of conversation, positive conversation, and so I, I just want to. I just wanted to say that I do have an emotional attachment with the dome as well, and, and, and good luck. What, whatever I can do, whatever my wife can do, we will do for to keep, keep the dome. I would say we, we may uh, go back in history and see what the Parisians did when they thought the Eiffel Tower was such an eyesore. What did they do to get past that and, and keep it. And now I know they would freak if anybody wanted to tear that down. The dome is our Eiffel Tower. 
the dome is our, our Empire State Building. We need to keep the dome at, at, at all costs. Would it be a bond election, would we have to have a bond election to tear it down, to raise the money to tear it down? Quite likely. Uh, depends on who stepped forward to finance it. Uh, we had the proposal by the rodeo and the Texans. Uh, I believe it's safe to say they've backed off that proposal and that's no longer out there on the table where they were intimating that they might be willing to pay for the, the demolition or as they called it, repurposing. And I'm going, I don't think it's repurposing if you tear it down and build a, a model. Uh, but probably anything that spends over 50 or $60 million is going to require a bond election. But, uh, you know, I've already gotten letters. I mentioned the, the Mountain Biking Association earlier. You know, they've, they've already written and said, if you put a mountain biking trail in there, we'll design, build, pay for, and maintain it. Now, that's not a decision that we would make yet, but the more people that come forward with that, the, uh, the venue for performances, Obviously, that could be a privatized situation where, where they could contribute. The Texas Medical Center, a health and wellness facility, a science, technology, and engineering, mathematics uh, facility that could go somewhere in the dome. Uh, my goal is to make sure we preserve as much of the nine acres as we can so that Offshore Technology Conference can use it, uh, Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo can use that, uh, Think about the, the kitty rides and the food. By now, all those food stands are on the little street between the, the, uh, the center and, and the dome. Move those in out of the weather. I mean, it's got great potential. And whether or not it requires a bond will just depend on what goes in it. And it all doesn't have to happen at once. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm of a mind that if we can get the base done first, and allow people to go in there, then the rest will begin to fill in, a, in an appropriate way. We, I'm using the collective we, because it was the National Trust and Preservation Houston, Houston Mod, uh, Houston Arts and Media, uh, the AIA chapter here locally in Houston, uh, formed an education coalition last fall in support of the bond initiative, uh, but really to raise awareness. And we, we actually made, um, maybe 10% pragmatic, but 90% intentional decision uh, not to try and, and overtake all those other websites and Facebook pages and Twitter uh, handles and, and all of the energy and organic support of the Astrodome. Uh, we, we tried to reach out and engage those folks and pull them in and we had some marketing materials. Um, yeah, we, we, while you were collecting your seats at the dome, uh, David and I were uh, in the back of a 26-foot box truck, lovingly <laughs> referred to as the dome mobile. So uh, we had some efforts. We, of course, are, are limited by our capacities. Uh, but I'm, I'm proud to say that that same coalition is here on the stage uh, with the judge and with the sports corporation uh, to, to continue our efforts to engage uh, voters and residents of Harris County to talk about whatever that message is that resonates with folks and to educate them as to the value and the worth of re reusing um, and redeveloping the Astrodome. So um, ideal, in an ideal world, we could, we could just wipe all those other websites and Twitter handles off uh, the face of the planet and have our own but we think it's very advantageous that there is so much organic support for the Astrodome, and our goal is to engage those folks um, wherever they may be, and I, I think that's, you know, that's why I'm here on the stage, because Matthew and I have, have connected and, and realized that there's synergy between our efforts, and together uh, we can move the effort forward. Ultimately, this is gonna be a political campaign. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the proper way to phrase this. You know, I'm 65 years old. I've just been reelected to a four-year term. This is my political campaign now. Uh, and beginning in January, we've got to coalesce everybody. We saw Prop 1 pass statewide with almost 80% of the vote. But you have to spend money. You have to get voices out there that people listen to. 
as a county judge, I'm seen as a politician, so you know, you're gonna have some people who listen and some don't, but you talked about Willie Mays. We need to find the Willie Mays of, of our time. We need to, to, but we also need you. When you hear people on the radio, on the talk shows, saying things that are outrageous, we need you to call in and say, wait, that's not true. Uh, you know, and, and begin pushing back because the dome is, is, is going to be saved. We've got to, to do it and, and we'll make every effort. Judge, they're calling into my show, by the way. Do you care to co-host my radio shows with us on KPRC? More than happy to have you. If it starts with your office, we'll go over there. We got, let's, let's do two more questions. Yeah. Let's go to one here real quick. Yes, sir. A lot of new people come to Houston, and they don't have that emotional attachment and, and even an understanding of how important the building is historically and architecturally. And to answer the gentleman in the back, you know, preservationists, we also wear a hat called a recycling hat, an environmentalist. And I think we don't get that message out enough that a, an existing building is the greenest building there is in the world. And it has to be repurposed, much as this building where we are tonight. And the Astrodome is a prime candidate for that. And I, I, everybody today is concerned about the environment and recycling. And we want to recycle the Harris County Dome Stadium. That's what you can get behind if you uh, care about your planet and your environment. You may not understand historic preservation. You may not understand the significance of the building. Um, and I, I think we need to give that message out as well. Uh, preservation and the environment go hand in hand. Um, the first people to recycle were preservationists, saving the first building. So I think that's part of our our charge is to reach those people that don't get that warm, fuzzy feeling about the dome, but they might care about their planet and they might care about their, their city that we need to recycle and use our buildings over and over and over because once they go to a landfill, they're there forever and it, it is astronomical to spend ridiculous that amount to demolish a building when that can be uh, to move toward a, a, a better purpose. Yeah, one back there. Thank you very much. I know you've been waiting right back there, ma'am. Yeah. We have one last question. Thank you for waiting patiently. My name's Julia G, and uh, I'm a native Houstonian. And I just want to piggyback on what Randy was talking about, because I've been following the issue, maybe not intimately, but it seems like over the years when they're discussing it, you know, they're talking about the historic preservation, don't demolish it, keep it green, you know, all those uh, great things. Or, but, and it seems like also there's a strategic uh, issues on getting voters, one, to c even come and vote. And maybe on second thought, there's a way you have to target voters to actually come. Besides those messages that they've been talking about and talking about the redevelopment, what about talking about the bottom line or economic development effect for Houston? So for the people who aren't natives here and who don't have that bond, but they understand uh, jobs, you know, tax revenues, um, opportunities of that. And, you know, that trickle-down effect has an you know, economic basis or, you know, um, something that can really explode positively for our city. So it just seems like I hadn't really heard in all the articles and even discussions about that economic effect besides what redevelopment can cost but what the positive aspects, you know, new jobs, et cetera, et cetera, you know, for the city and all the taxing entities. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, I have to be careful how I say this. You know, people who are interested in historic preservation are already for it. Our problem there is just getting them to participate and come out. But to get other people for it, it has to be a discussion of, hey, look, this is an economic asset that belongs to you Let's make the highest and best use of it. And I moved here in 1966. And that area around the dome was just booming. You know, all the motels, I can still recite them. You, you had Capan's restaurant and Sunny Look's restaurant down at the corner. And you look at that whole area now, and it's in decline. One of the reasons the Urban Land Institute's coming is not just to look at the dome, 
but also take a look at the impact of changing the dome, what it will have on the community. Think about how the Texas Med Center has grown. It, it's moving right down there all the time. So we have to make the economic argument to get the other people, and we have to make sure that the historic preservation people are engaged and turn out. Now, this has nothing to do with the dome, but one of the saddest things to me is, is another landmark that went away, and that's the Shamrock. I look back at that and think, if they had known how rapidly the Texas Medical Center was going to grow, would they have really done away with that hotel? Maybe, maybe not. But the dome is going to be the center, that the NRG Park is going to be the economic center for all of that part of of Houston and Harris County, Buffalo Speedway is being extended to the south. You're going to have more and more people living down there, and, and we've got to make that economic argument for sure. And I'll just um, say something that maybe the judge can't or won't, doesn't want to say. I, you talked earlier about accountability, and when you hear misinformation on the radio, call in. Um, I agree completely, and it's such a valid point that we've got to make the economic argument. We have to talk about the bottom line. But I have witnessed this man say for 12 months now that there is no debt on that building, and I can turn on our local news and still hear that there is debt on that building. And so there is, a, a, there is misinformation out there that is not being corrected, and that's where all of us in our conversations at school, at church, at the workplace, can begin to counter this misinformation that's out there. Um, that, I mean, it's not surprising. We have a 24-hour news cycle, and uh, our networks are competing, our local news entities are competing for what sells. And what sells is that there's a ton of money owned on that building, and that is inaccurate information. Um, and so it makes it a lot harder for those of us who are trying to make the economic argument in favor of reuse and the environmental argument uh, in favor of repurposing this building uh, when our mass media is, is extolling the opposite. So I think we can all play a role um, you know, in, in helping to, to correct the record there. Beth, I'm going to use that point to a very good point to kind of wind things up because I want to be wary of the time here to get out of here at 9 o'clock. Uh, before we guys let you go, we do want to thank you for the time. Round of applause for this wonderful panel here. This is, and to the best point, what Matthew did with this film, this is, I'm not going to say it's a starting point because it's already been started, but this is one of the most divisive topics if you go anywhere around the city of Houston. I mean, I work in a newsroom, and just yesterday, just two, two of the reporters, they were just talking about the Astrodome, either memories or what they want to do with it, just out of the blue. I mean, it's something that, that continues to need to be figured out. Uh, having said that, I want to give you guys uh, and ladies one quick chance to, uh, for any final words. Uh, Beth, uh, ladies first, if you would like to start, just okay. to kind of wrap it up, just final thoughts from you. Thanks. There are perks to being the only <laughs> skirt up here. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Matthew, for having us. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, and uh, I think you're the perfect example of kind of the grassroots um, movement that is that we're seeing gel around the Astrodome. And I feel very fortunate to have landed in Houston uh, at the right time when the momentum uh, is really building around this because goodness knows there have been people working for many, many, many years around the Astrodome, but Not there is <laughs> a decade, a decade, okay. But there's an energy and there is um, an excitement around the potential to reuse the Astrodome and I think um, yeah, we in the preservation field in Houston work to educate folks um, about the significance and the, the um, positives of reusing the building. And we welcome all of you and your friends and colleagues and families to join our efforts. So you can find us at preservationhouston.org um, and you can connect with us there. Thanks for having us. Gotcha. Dave, you have one? Thanks. Um, I think one of the things, and, and we've sort of touched on it with the, with the economic impact, is we have a building that would cost at least $150 million to build today. And <laughs> to send that... Yeah, you need to go at, that Yeah, that minimum. <laughs> that, that's, that's just a number I saw out there. And um, part of it, we're talking about 
the possibility of just shipping it to the landfill is what a lot of people are saying is the best use for this. Um, economically, it just doesn't make sense. Environmentally, it doesn't make sense. Um, preservation, we get sort of esoteric sometimes with the architectural significance and the, you know. It's an important building, it's an important landmark, and it means a lot to people. One of the um, participants in the ULI panel is, is going to be a uh, former mayor of Pittsburgh. And he was mayor when Three River Stadium was demolished. And he's coming down here to help us look at not just saving the stadium, but redeveloping the whole area because it's not just Energy Park. And one of the things he said was they lost Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh because nobody cared. But people here do actually care about the Astrodome, so we do have that going for us. So, so we're sort of a step ahead in, in that area. Thank you very much, Dave. Judge Emmett, final words if you could, sir. You know, right after I became county judge, I realized I could solve all the transportation problems, cure mental health, cure mental illness, provide for indigent health care, but what people really were going to light my emails up about was the Astrodome. And it's true to this day. A story that appears in the Chronicle about the dome, you'll have hundreds of comments on it, pro and con, but mainly con. You know, people are really adamantly against it. So the, the people who are against it are adamant, I'll put it that way. And we need to hear from those because I'm convinced that a vast majority of people if they think that the use is worthwhile, they really would prefer to save the dome rather than tear it down. Quick story. Uh, none of you have seen my cufflinks yet, but I'm very busy one day sitting in my office, being somewhat growly. I know my staff would never think that. <laughs> and Leanna puts her head in and says, uh, their deputy so-and-so wants to see you. I said, I don't have time to see the deputy right now. And about two other staff people put their head in and said, no, you really want to see him. And so, okay. So, yeah, matter of fact, you were there, weren't you? Were you there that day? Well, you showed me later yeah, that afternoon. Yeah, later that afternoon. You're very proud of me. I am. <laughs> and this deputy sheriff puts his head in and comes in, and he says, I want to give you a present. And I said, okay, what is it? And he opens a box and it's cufflinks with the Astrodome. And I said, okay. He said, my father worked security for Judge Hoffines. And we want you to have these. And I said, I can't possibly take those. I mean, this, this is a keepsake beyond all keepsakes. He says, no, no, no. We want you to keep fighting. So that's what we're doing. Fantastic. Well, before I let you go, I'll say this, one of my lasting memories of the, uh, of the Astrodome is probably, in my mind, the most famous quote ever uttered inside the Astrodome. And I'm gonna paraphrase it right now, thanks to your film and the great panelists. I think tonight we kicked the son of a bitch in. <laughs> we did. A round of applause. We'll let those guys go off stage before we wind up. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Matt, I'm a few more minutes. I just want to ask Matthew a few more things about this film. Now that you're an award-winning film, what's your next step? A little Spielberg action, as I said? Uh, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, before, first, before I, uh, bef before I answer that question, I want to acknowledge that it took a lot of people to make this happen tonight. And uh, if you were a volunteer, I want you to get a round of applause and stand up and, uh, and be acknowledged for being a part of this event. So thank you very much. So I, you know, I, I'm happy to say that the biggest compliment that I ever got from this film was when someone would say, wow, I didn't know that about the Astrodome. And I didn't really want to save it. I didn't want to do anything, but after seeing your film, it has convinced me that we should look into it a little bit more. And, uh, and so, 
that actually inspired me to reach out to several A-list professionals in the media business. And uh, some of them are here tonight. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're actually, uh, we've got David Reynolds in the back, uh, who's uh, running in production today. And then we have uh, Bill Clem, who's uh, right here. Uh, and Paige was actually the uh, person who was handling the microphone earlier. We're coming together, and we have decided that we just scratched the surface on the facts. So we're going to do a full feature film called The Biggest Room. And the reason why we're calling it The Biggest Room is because it is still the largest column-free space in the world, but it was also the biggest room that people wanted to be in. Whether you're a priest, a king, a spectator, a politician, you wanted to be there. And so our goal is to actually have the, uh, the, the film done in April of 2015, better which hurt, is the anniversary hurt. of Let's the uh, uh, grand opening, 50-year right. anniversary. 50 years. And, uh, and so ultimately, that's, uh, we're, we're working hard. And, uh, and, and we really want, uh, hopefully, if uh, we can uh, ask uh, Judge Emmett and Harris County Sports and Convention Corporation, we're going to premiere it at the Astrodome and uh, on the outside of the Astrodome. That's impressive. We need your help. We ultimately need to ask you to please consider going to our fundraising page, thebiggestroom.com, and just donating a little bit to us and telling at least 20 friends about this night and what we can do in the future for the Astrodome by getting the facts out. Because the facts alone, I believe, will be the ones that actually convince people to save the Astrodome. So thank you very much. That looks for exciting. Being Are you guys excited about that? A feature film. Feature film. Listen, if you do want to kick off that fundraising campaign, stop by the table in the back. Matthew, you're going to be signing posters. Anyone's willing to donate $20. Autograph. Look, he's already signing autographs for money. We appreciate everybody for coming. Thank you very much, all the production folks. And Matthew, congratulations again. My name is Michael Garfield. We're going to see you on the radio. Have a great evening. This event, it's over.